So, Christiana, tell us, let's just start with your childhood. I grew up a church kid. Um, Kojic, Church God in Christ, all day long, from the time I was born until I got married, I think. Um, yep, so church all the time. I never did, like, a lot of school stuff. Like, I wasn't in the band or, like, mm -hmm. a cheerleader, any of that stuff. Like, everything was church stuff. Like, I'm from a small town, and our church family was really, like, a family. Like, so the whole thing just kind of moved like that. Like, it was just the culture. It's what you did. You went to church all the time. What was worship in your mind? Like, when you look back then, like, what were your, was your understanding of what worship is? Growing up a church kid, it has an interesting dynamic. It's great foundation. You learn so much about the Bible. And I think that all of the teachings that we got were really, really great. But there's so much culture in it. And when you're born into it like that, it's just what you know. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like this um, repetitious or routine, I guess is the word that I'm looking for. It becomes like a routine and it's what we did. I grew up with all of these singers, right? Like, I mean, flat foot singers, like just for no reason. You've got my mom. Um, my god sister's mother, there were just a group of those singers and that was just the sound that it was. And then everybody had babies <laughs> and then there was me, you know, like, and so I had to kind of fill these like big giant shoes. Um, and to me at that point, like it, it wasn't worship. It was me trying to fill that, th that, those big shoes, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, wanting to sound good enough and wanting, you know what I'm saying? Like wanting like acceptance almost from like these big giant singers. So I don't think that I understood really what I was doing at the time, if that makes sense. So tell me a little bit about the Christiana, the, the teenager. Like I was a good kid. I really was. Um, I was, a f I was too scared to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That was the we benefit were, of the church kid, yes, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. That is definitely a benefit of the church kid for sure. Um, and I think that um, a lot of the issues that I have kind of overcome with like perfectionism and stuff were in that space. There's, a, there's another thing with church there. When you grow up in church, like you're really afraid to mess up. Um, it's, I don't know how to explain it or maybe I don't have the words right now. I don't know. I'll figure them out or something, but... It's like you, like even if you do mess up, you want to hide it and hide it quickly. <laughs> isn't that isn't that interesting? It is interesting. Um, like there's like you don't feel like there's a lot of room for error. You just don't. Um, and especially where I'm from, like it's a really small town, and so everybody is kind of like involved in everybody's life. If that makes sense, like. I love them all, but it's almost very unhealthy the way that people are you know, involved in, in your everyday doings. Um, so you feel like you can't mess up and you feel like you have all these people that you don't want to let down. Um, so coming into my teenage years, like, you know, where most people are figuring out who they are, I'm checking boxes. Do you know what I'm saying? Like to make sure that like I'm doing the stuff that everybody thinks that I should be doing. Tell me a little bit about, you know, getting out of high school and make the decision to go to college? What did you choose and why? We had this thing at school, my computer class, and the Art Institute of Pittsburgh came and they did a big presentation and um, they talked to us about graphic design and I'd never heard this in my life. So they were talking about that and I was so captivated by it. Like I went home and I was like, mom, like, I know what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Please, 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 please. <laughs> like, I want to do this. And so then I went to the Art Institute. And then I got there. And I feel like, you know, and you're, like, in a small town. And, like, everybody knows everybody. And, like, you know, whatever. And that was just, like, in this big city to me, right? <laughs> Pittsburgh, super big city. Um, and I'm getting to know people I've never met. And seeing things from different perspectives. Um, and so it was kind of the start of that process where I feel like I was kind of starting to question some things. So you're done with college. Mm -hmm. What'd you do next? I graduated from college and um, I got a job at American Greetings. And so I moved back from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. And um, I got a job in my field, check that box. Um, and it was a big deal because I was the first one in my house to go to school and then I met well I didn't meet my husband I'd known my husband like we grew up together but that in that space is where I got married 
So right after college, you got a job, and and then somehow there, you guys got connected. He and I had grown up together, so we knew each other. And at the time, he was um, recruiting and um, living in Cleveland. So I called him, like, you know, like you call your friend, right? Like, hey, um, I'm moving to Cleveland. We should hang out. And we hung out. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know we started dating in January, right? And then October of the same year, we got married. At that point, was he... He is based in the U.S., or he had to deploy somewhere? So he was still... Um, recruiting in the the states but he was already stationed like set up to move to germany i got pregnant and we knew he was leaving um but the way that things were set up like i wasn't able to leave with him so um he got over there and basically the second that he showed up for work they were like hey by the by like you're gonna get deployed too so for me, it took five months, maybe longer than that, because he left when I was seven months pregnant, and I didn't get over there until Xavier was five months old. Wow. And so now I'm a new mom, um, I'm a new wife, and I'm a new army wife at that, and I'm dropped off in Germany for a year by myself. At that moment in your life, did you feel like, okay, my life is in cruise control, everything's work, everything's going great? There were questions about the decisions that I was making, but I was checking boxes <laughs> and the box, like, you know, like the list looked good. Um, and I really felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do. Personally, like I was questioning some things, but I was too afraid to say that. I still didn't, I didn't know who I was. You know what I'm saying? Like, I hadn't figured me out yet. And so I feel like it was like this struggle of like doing what I'm supposed to do and wanting to figure out this whole other girl or maybe not like another girl, but like who, you know what I'm saying? Like who God really intended me to be. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have to flee. Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. And now I'm in this environment where I don't know anybody. I have no frame of reference for anything and I have to navigate my own life. Like I don't, I don't have my village of people when I don't know, be like, hey guys, um, what do I do now? And they're like, oh, you go do da 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 da. And it's like, you know, that sounds like a great idea. I'm gonna go do that, check that block, that's great. But now I gotta figure it out by myself. And you know, again, like not wanting to let anybody down or do it wrong. Um, and now I got kids, right? So that's a whole different ball of wax. Um, and Xavier, 
Xavier was my first baby. He's 10 now. Um, but he was my little dude. Like, it was me and him against the world having him because um, I was alone a lot. Military life is, is tough. Like, I always feel for the spouses, you spend a lot of time by yourself. If they're not training or, you know, deployed, you, you just spend a lot of time alone. So Xavier, I feel like, carried me through some of that, too. Were, were you able to find a church? Or were you able to connect with God in some way, uh, even in a personal level? Initially, the first church that I found was a Kojic church, right? Listen, this is what I know. This is what I do. I'm going to go to this Kojic church. We're going to be good. It's going to put all the stuff together for me. So I go to this Kojic church, um, and don't get me wrong, they are so the sweetest people on the planet. Um, they weren't great singers, and I was so confused. <laughs> like, I had never, ever, ever, ever been to church where people didn't just like sing for no reason, right? And I like, like literally, like no joke, this was like my first experience being at a culture church and people just didn't flat foot sing and I was so lost. Like I didn't even know what to do. So I made friends with this, um, with this girl and she took me to her church. And um, it was really, really nice. Like, of course it was very, um, Multicultural. The pastor was the white guy, this older white guy, Pastor Brian, I'll never forget him. And he played the guitar and he just did worship in such a authentic way. Like I had never been in an environment like that. Like I come from really hard preaching, really hard singing. You know, I mean, the church is up. There's a lot of hooting. There's a lot of hollering. There's a lot of sweating happening. <laughs> there's things going on, right? And for the first time, I was in an environment where there was a sermon happening and he was just talking like this and out in the tears that were flowing from my eyes. Like, I mean, he was really preaching and he never hollered one time. It was great. And the worship team wasn't, they weren't, they weren't like this, like super amazing worship team, but they loved to worship. They really loved to worship. And they just sang like, you know, kind of staple, um, Christian songs, like how great is our God, like those songs that kind of can go gospel or, you know what I'm saying? So I knew the words and that. And so um, I came to rehearsal and I was singing with them, um, but I was still kind of trying to hang out in the back. So like, you know what I'm saying? I was just kind of sing to myself a little bit and not super loud, you know, cause I didn't want to draw a whole lot of attention to myself. <laughs> but yeah, so like there, I feel like it kind of started the ball, ball rolling where I was having a, a different kind of experience, which I think for some people, for me was important. I think sometimes when you come out of what's comfortable and what you know, like you can hear it differently, if that makes sense. Yes. How long did you spend in the military base? Or, or in, in total, Germany. or just in Germany? In Germany. Um, we were there for a year and a half, what, I think. Where did you go next? New Jersey. Oh, wow. That's quite a different place. Oh, it was. And it was, I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited because um, my godfather had moved to New Jersey. So, yeah, we moved to New Jersey, and we were there for three years. Amelia was born um, in, the, in the Jersey phase, so... Um, I had Xavier and <laughs> when I had Xavier, I was like, I don't, I don't want any more kids. I'm cool. Um, and then Xavier started, um, preschool and there. It was every day and it was all day. And at that time he was my purpose, mm -hmm. you know? And so my purpose was gone and I wanted another baby. Like, so he was, he was three. Um, I had gotten pregnant. And I had a miscarriage. That was really hard. That was really hard. And um, it was early in the pregnancy, but just like the feelings of failure. Tell us a little bit about the, the impact of both experiencing a miscarriage, which is incredibly hard. But at the same time, you're realizing the community that you have around you that can help you through that. It was like, hey, I've been through this too, and you can survive it, right? So in my mind, like, I internalized that, like, all right, let me get my life together and just stop being a mess. And so um, what I actually did mentally was I literally had just accepted that 
Xavier, if, if, if Xavier was my only one, that I was blessed to have him um, and just be okay with it and just stop being a puddle. When people talk to me about it and like, I, I was kind of looking like, well, if she survived it and she's okay, then I gotta be okay, right? So I, I have to stop what I'm feeling um, go back to the checklist, right? Yes, yes. You have to go back to the checklist. Like, these, these things are working great. You know what I'm saying? So get over yourself. Then where'd you go next? We went to Tennessee, but I had my daughter first. So my daughter, um, you know, like I said, like I had the miscarriage. And um, I, I really wanted another baby. I remember I wanted a girl so bad. Oh, man, I wanted a little girl so bad. And I don't know why, but I thought that having her, one, like I said, like my son was back at school, and so I didn't feel like I had purpose. Um, and so I was losing stuff to dive myself into so I could keep ignoring the fact that there was some internal work that I needed to do. Um, so having her definitely fulfilled that need, but I felt like having her would fix my marriage. And, and now, looking at it, like I needed her for me. Tell me a little bit more about your daughter because it looks like she <laughs> she was born with this all these important roles in her life she didn't know about. <laughs> Poor thing, I know. Um, but yeah, I I had an agenda for her. Like she was, I, you know, I, I felt like she was going to be the glue that put my marriage back together. Um, but honestly, I feel like she was the glue that put me back together. Um, wanting her to never have to settle wanting her to understand who she was before she ever made real life decisions so that she can make effective ones, wanting her to never have to repeat the mistakes that I did. I'm sure she's going to make a batch of her own, um, but I don't want her to make mine. Um, so it, it made me, it forced me to care about myself more, to push harder at life. Um, so, Again, that blog that I have, um, it's all about hair. And I made a blog about one of the entries was about my daughter and what I wanted for her. Um, and it was super cool because um, being here at the church, like we've kind of formed this little circle of people that we have. And one of them took my, my words and made it into a song for my daughter um, and somebody else was able to provide the music. And so it's just been a really cool experience to be able to say how I feel about her, like through music. Post and do, post and do.
Let's break free. Let's agree. The blessing, a curly head girl. I love you, my curly haired girl. My prayer is that the lessons that my hair have taught me will manifest themselves in you, that your life will be better because of them. I'm blessed to be a part of your curl family. I'm honored to detangle and twist the very strands that will give you strength one day. I'm grateful that God has gifted me something as precious as you. Wanting better for you has caused me to want better for myself. Know that you are beautiful, talented, and a force to be reckoned with. Know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I love you. So when we initially moved to Tennessee, um, I lived on post. I lived on post. So I'm starting over again, right? We're getting good at that. <laughs> um, and trying to find community, trying to find a church, trying to, you know, do all of that stuff, right? Um, but he was at work. And it was very different from him being at work when we lived in um, New Jersey. It was more of a regular role, and he was gone a lot. I had gotten lost in being his wife and being a mom of two kids. It was all that I was, like I wasn't a person anymore. He had gotten deployed, it was like a surprise deployment. And I feel like, like I was like, literally like just coming undone. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it was like every time I turned around, it was something. Um, and even though, like, I felt like, you know, we were kind of going through that stuff where I'm finding myself and like, you know, there's friction, but he was still the only thing that I knew. And now that's gone too. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, and now I'm here by myself again and I hate this place and I hate my life and you're leaving me. I don't like this place, but I said to myself, you know what? And maybe if I can have some roots, right? Like, I'll feel better about it. So, literally, in a day, we decided to buy a home and settle there. So, while I was pregnant with Amelia, um, I flipped a few pieces of furniture for her bedroom. And that's kind of how furniture was born. So, being a military wife, like, you move around a bunch. Your space changes a million times. And you don't want to buy, you know what I'm saying, like, mm -hmm. furniture, right? So, I got really good at thrifting and finding pieces that I could repaint, repurpose, restain, whatever, and make them work for my space. I started doing it for people. And then I had a friend of mine push me to do like a show. So now we got a brand new life in Tennessee. Big mm -hmm. house, kids are happy. Mm -hmm. um, are you happy? I felt like I was drowning for a really long time. And I didn't know how this was gonna go or how, I, like I couldn't find my way out of it. I had made friends with um, some people and um, they were looking for a church home as well and I started going to church with them and one day I um, I came out and I picked up my son from children's church and he looked at me and he said mommy did did you sing today and I was like no and he looked so disappointed and I was like huh you know, like just this kind of like yeah. moment, like where it was like, I should probably be doing that. Music was something that I was born with, but I'd never really dug into it. Never really 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like try to figure it out or navigate it or really figure out what God wanted from me with it. Like I didn't. It was the first time I had really started to hear like contemporary Christian music. Okay. I had never heard this type of music before. You know, I'm a, I'm a gospel girl. Um, that's what I know. And so they're singing these songs um, with a lot of words. <laughs> so many words. Um, but the words were tearing me up. By the time I did the audition, um, I, I still wasn't familiar with that music, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I remember the guy asked me, like, well, you know, what song you know, do you want to do whatever, whatever. And I, I fell in love with Holy Spirit. Like that song, I loved it. I mean, I played it in a car. I would sing it in the, when I'm washing my kids up, like it was, it was just so in me, you know? So that was the song that I auditioned with. And then I was on their team. could ever come close no thing can compare your living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame
there were some things that started to happen that started challenging me. Um, you got to rem- so I'm I'm in this I'm in this space right in this new sound, and people that don't really sound like me or understand where I come from, um, and so it makes you a little insecure. It's one Holy Spirit. Yeah. But you're yeah. in a in a, you find yourself in a situation where mm-hmm. we all worship one Holy Spirit, but I I don't know if I fit in here. Like I'm in my 30s and I'm still trying to figure out who I am and where I fit, you know? Mm-hmm. And just like, shouldn't I have this by you know what I mean? <laughs> like, shouldn't I have this by now? And so, um, like I said, there were some things that happened. Um, that taught me a lot about myself in that space. Um, Looking back at it now, right, I feel like I left there very hurt. Um, But I also can see how I played a role in my own infliction as well. Understanding that, like, even though I was hurt, understanding the gravity of the gift that I had been given for the first time in my life, you know? And I remember calling my godfather and being like, dad, I'm sorry for every time I held back from you. Like I've always been really shy and scared to sing. Like, even though it was my upbringing, you know, Mm -hmm. like I said, like I always felt like I had to fill these shoes and, and I didn't fit, you know? And so I was always scared and I always just, you know, I'm still learning right now. Like, you know, like, how to really let go like it's it's hard and it's an ongoing battle for me but you know in that space like I was I was really interested in really discovering myself and what I could offer them and what they could offer me back like I was excited about that and everything just came to a screeching halt and I was like oh my gosh and then there were other things that were happening that literally had me questioning some of like the foundational stuff that I had been raised on like biblically right And that space where you realize that you probably need to look this up for yourself. I feel like I had been writing off what I had been told. And so I remember going to my Tennessee godmother's house and um, talking with her. And she (laughs) looked at me so simply and she said, it sounds like you want something from God. And I lost it (laughs) because I did. I wanted something from God and I didn't know what it was or how I was going to learn it or any of that, but I wanted it. I started praying. I like, and not, you know, of course, like I had prayed before, but I had really started praying like intentionally and really asking God, like, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? Like, I don't know. And I need your help. Like, for real, for real, I need your help. So what I started doing um, was getting up at five in the morning to pray. And I would do it every day. I got up at five, I turned on my worship music, and I prayed. And I wanted a church home so bad. And my daughter got sick, and we went to the hospital. And the nurse there um, was talking to me, and she was saying she liked my kids' names or whatever it was. And um, she looked at me and stopped talking mid-sentence and was just like, do, do you have a church home? Like, do you, do you want to come to my church? And I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how did she know that? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and it was one of those moments where I felt like, that, like God heard me, you know, he heard me. And she told me about her church and I went home and I looked it up and um, I liked what I saw. Like, cause now I'm careful. You know, now I'm careful. I felt like I hadn't done my homework and I feel like I want to know what's going on before I walk in the door. And that way I don't have to be surprised. So I did my homework first and I felt comfortable and I went and I fell in love. They were starting a choir and they had made this announcement like, hey, anybody is welcome to come. And they had a praise team and they, I mean, they were lit. Listen, this praise team went in hard. They was jumping around, like the whole place was just jumping. I loved it, it was great. The word was good. And I felt like it was where I was, you know what I'm saying? Like it was what I needed to really grow and to get where, and it was answering questions that I had for myself. In the midst of this, right, um, I had decided that I wanted to open a store. So my best friend, I'm talking to her about this, and she's like, why are you always trying to baby step God? I'm trying to figure out 
why you can't never just do it? Right? Like, it's on your heart to do a business, Shauna. Like, just do that. Like, stop trying to take all these cute little steps to get there because it makes sense. God doesn't make sense. Just do the stuff. And I was mad. I'm not going to lie. Who asked you? But at the same time, I was mad because it was the truth. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to hear it. Long story short, my husband had gotten deployed and there was a chunk of money that we had. And I was like, I really want to take a chunk of this money and do the store. So, I had come up with this crazy idea, right, that I was going to take $10,000 and I was going to offer it to these people for this building for the year, okay? I know how much the rent is and how much it actually works out. It does not work out to $10,000, to be clear. Um, but I was like, I'm going to offer them $10,000 and I will tell them that we'll renovate the place. And if they'll let me have the place for the year, they can get to $10,000 and we can call it a wash, right? And I go and I present it to the real estate agent and she says, call me back when you have more money. And I was heartbroken, 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 heartbroken. So in the midst of this, I'm at this church. I go to the choir rehearsal and um, after choir rehearsal, the praise and worship leader comes up to me and says, hey, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, me? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I need you to stay and talk to you. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, um, so I'm going to need you on the worship team. And I'm like, oh, no. And he's like, no, yeah, I looked you up. You're going to need to be on the worship team. Not up for debate. And I'm like, but I'm getting ready to open this store. I'm, you know what I'm, saying? I'm getting ready to do all of these things because I'm still, in my mind, I'm still speaking those things as though they were. Like, I don't have this store yet, but I'm telling people I'm going to have one, right? I shifted my focus, and I'm singing on their worship team. Now, mind you, this worship team, I felt like, um, we were kind of like all like around the same age um, and everybody was really talented. So I felt comfortable there, um, but I was still kind of hiding. So then by April, I got a phone call. I was sitting at the barbershop with my son and um, it's a real estate agency. Hi, um, I, we just wanted to call you about um, the space that you looked at downtown um, we want to accept your offer. I couldn't wait to tell people how God had moved, you know what I'm saying, to give me this thing and just, you know, just the story. Like it was nothing but God. Like there was no other way that this happened. Now you're in a place where when you first came in, you hated. Yes. But now, and now you're in I'm a in place love with where, it. you know, you got an answer, what you believe is an answer from God. You got a church that really, really loves you, have you there, and you love the church, and you, you're getting this incredible connection. Um, life is good. Great. So nothing can go wrong. Life is fantastic. Um, it's still kind of tough at home. And so I get a phone call, and it's like, oh, are you sitting down? And I'm like, oh, what's this about? And... Um, basically, I found out that we were on assignment and we had to move again. So I'm closing my store in preparation to relocate again. Where would you go? Oklahoma. Okay. Going to Oklahoma. Um, so I'm closing my store and um, I just, I doesn't care about anything anymore. You know, like, like, God, why would, you, why would you give me something like this and take it from me and trying to figure out what I did wrong? Because I'm checking boxes, <laughs> you know? I done checked my boxes. And now I feel like I have a better sense of who I am. And I really am pursuing you. And I really am trying to be who you made me to be. And I asked if it wasn't for me for you to take it and you opened this door for me to slam it in my face. Why? Why? And I didn't care about anything. And um, I was driving in the car one day and this song came on the radio. Um, the song was initially written for a man who had lost his wife. And the man who wrote it said that he was actually in the hospital with him when it happened. And he kept saying, that he heard the husband kept saying, you're always good, you're always good. And he wrote this song and like, I just remember bawling 
like the whole way home, you know, and thinking if this man who had lost his wife, right, if he can really believe that God is always good, even in that space, like he's got to still be good then, you know, like it just had to be. So I remember calling my friend Vondra and I was sharing the song with her and the story. And, you know, Vondra has done a lot of life with me and we're crying and we crying together, <laughs> like, you know, whatever. And I remember the day that I had to return the keys, they had a, um, a park behind um, the street that I was on. They had just redone, it was beautiful. And I was sitting in the chair <laughs> and Vondra texted me, but she sent me the song back to me. She had no idea that that was the day that I was giving back my keys, she had no idea. Um, but she texted me that song and she was like, I heard God say this for you today. And so that song, you know what I'm saying? Like just really, mm -hmm. really carried me through like a really, really tough space. You start to question everything. You question everything. I questioned my purpose all over again. Like I had never found, like everything that I had just done over the last cup, throw that out, throw it out, throw it all out. And then you start making dumb decisions, things that are not in your character because you operate out of your brokenness, you know? Um, and so at that point, I was forced to just really start evaluating the home stuff. Now I got to deal with it, right? And at the end of the day, I just, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't. So 
um, I left. I left and um, and I came here. So you pack everything, you move to? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. My mom moved in with me and that has been absolutely amazing. And there is no version of this story where I could have done this stuff without her. It's just not. Um, divorce is not easy. Um, you don't just lose your marriage. You lose people. You are questioning, again, foundational stuff. We don't believe in divorce. And we don't, you know what I'm saying? And so now I'm doing the stuff that you're taught never to do. Um, <laughs> but all the while feeling healthy doing it. You know what I'm saying? So it's like internally, like mentally, you're going through this stuff, but I'm gaining weight. Um, I'm smiling again. Um, you know, like, and even though everything around me, like, is so unsure, right? I'm happy. Uh, tell us about finding a new church. How, <laughs> how did you land here? Ah, okay. So <laughs> my mom comes in and she moves in with me and she's like, we got to find a church. And I'm driving to work one day and I'm listening to Sirius XM radio and I'm on the Kirk Franklin station and they're interviewing Kristen. And I knew I had heard of Kristen Gray before. I knew who he was, um, but I didn't know nothing about him. And he's telling his story. And I can't get out of my car because his story sounds like my story. And I was getting ready to, you know, because they're wrapping up the interview and I'm getting ready to go um, into work. And they're like, so, um, you know, we hear that you're leading worship at this new church, whatever, whatever. And so he starts talking about it. And of course, I never in a million moons think that he's here, like in Cincinnati, like what? So I go home and I tell my mom, like, we gotta go check out this church. My mom and I had fell in love with Darlene Hicks. Um, it was the warmest place that we had been to thus far. She was so sweet to us from the time we came in. She was working on the welcome team and like, you know, showed us, and I mean, it's a big place, you know? And so she made sure we knew where to take the kids. And after service, she came back to our seats to make sure we knew where to go find them. And I felt like when I came here, you could feel that there was like a shift happening. I didn't know nothing about y'all or any of that, but like I could tell that things were like changing and moving and it, I wanted to be a part of that. And so we went to pizza with the pastor and they give you that little slip where you can, you know, say what departments you might be interested in. And of course, I'm going to the nursery, right? Mom, <laughs> eyes on your own paper. I'm going to the nursery. And um, my mom says, well, we sing. <laughs> Can't you ever be quiet? Everybody has a story. I think what impacted you the most, I would imagine, about turning the radio on and listening to Kristen is probably the question, like, how come can a worship leader have a story because that's not allowed? You know, by standard definition, people on the stage, people almost look at people on the stage like they don't have a story. And we're trying to change this narrative here. Like we're trying to change this conversation because we all have a story. I think that people do have this perception of people in leadership and they put these standards and these limitations on you that are really, really hard to keep up with, by the way. Um, and because we as leaders feel that pressure you don't feel safe enough to tell your story. It's, it's not permitted in a way, do you know what I'm saying? Because what does that look like when people know you're human? What does that look like when God actually has to be your salvation? You know, like that, that, mm -hmm. that whole concept, yeah. like I don't understand it because if, if God is the thing that keeps us why wouldn't you think that I need his help too? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't make any sense. But then still, even for myself, like, like this, this is hard, you know, telling my story. Like, it's, it's a really vulnerable thing to do. 
Um, and not just because of leadership, just people in general. You don't know how people are going to take things or how they're perceived or what people will think about you or whatever. But like for me, like I feel like being able to share it. If someone else can be free from hearing it, you know, like then it then it mattered. Mm -hmm. All of the stuff mattered and it was worth it. Shake at the 